surely are in this place. You surely are in our hearts. <clears throat> Father, your word says that if we abide in you, you would abide in us. God, as we sing this next song, I pray that that would be a truth that we're proclaiming to our souls, not just singing, but that it would be a command to ourselves, that we would depend on you, that we would know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Amen.
come quickly. Come ransom your bride that we may be with you forever. Deliver us from these immoral bodies. Take away this flesh that we have. Give us pure bodies, pure in your sight. God, I ask tonight for all of us that you would give us a fresh, clean, forgiven, washed heart. God, that we would put aside our differences, that we would lay aside our opinions, we would come together and we would love each other because you love us. And it's what you want us to do and there's no excuse for us not to do it. We wait for you, Jesus. Come quickly. We ask in your name. Amen. Wow. The littles? She's taking the littles? She's taking the littles for Skittles. If you guys have your Bibles with you, we're going to jump into Zechariah. So uh, we are going to jump in tonight to uh, the eight visions of Zechariah. Zechariah opens up roughly, this is a rough um, outline, one through eight is dealing primarily with the present, not wholly, but primarily with the present. Chapters 9 uh, through 14 are going to deal a little more with the future. Uh, but we have the eight um, visions that is kicked off by Zechariah. He has all eight visions on the same day. And the eight visions are a, a chiastic structure. You don't need to know that. I won't give you a test later. But the point of the chiasm is it emphasizes the middle. So... One and eight are the same, two are similar, two and seven are the same, three and six. They form a arrow's tip. So everything is pointing to chapters four and five. So the, the meat of what's trying to be getting or gotten across in the eight visions is all talking about chapter four and five, which is primarily going to deal with coming of Messiah. So tonight... We're going to look at the first four visions, so half of the arrowhead, okay? The other half of the arrowhead we'll do next time. So we're going to do four visions, three chapters, buckle in, because uh, as we work our way through, and we want to, along with all prophecy, here's one of the mistakes that people make doing, especially working through Old Testament prophecies, is we ignore what's happening to the people who received it. So when the prophet went to Israel and talked to Israel, there's something he wants them to know. It's not just a message to us 2,000 years later. You guys tracking with me? So we want to see what was, what was it that Zechariah is trying to light a fire under the people to accomplish, and how does that relate to us? So let's jump in. We'll be in verse 7, Zechariah chapter 1, the first vision, the rider on the red horse. Let's take a look. Now, on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. So, if you remember last time, Zechariah means God remembers. Uh, we know that the children of, of Israel have returned from the exile. They've built their own cities and, and houses, but the Lord's house has not been built yet. And the call of the disciples is to get cracking and get that done. On uh, roughly February 15th, 519 B.C., 
all these visions come to Zechariah, and Zechariah is going to deliver all those visions to those who are gathered there in Jerusalem. So he begins, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. So presumably we're dealing with at least four horsemen, perhaps, perhaps more. You get a little bit of a flavor for that when we get to the, uh, when we get to the eighth uh, vision. But he goes on just so we can kind of get the whole vision laid out. And I said, what are these, my Lord? So one of the things we need to know about the visions that Zechariah has, he has an angel there to explain it to him. So we should pay attention to that, right? So if the angels explain it to him, let's let the angel explain it to him. And we, we will try to have less fanciful ideas about what's going on. <laughs> what's the angel say? What is going on here? Um, so he said, the angel who talked to me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Now, if you want to kind of get the idea, basically what's happening is for Zechariah, God is parting the veil between the physical and the spiritual realm. And so you have the writers uh, that God sends out, we would call them angels, that go to and fro to check out what's going on the earth for uh, reasonable to see these are uh, the way the Lord chooses to see what's happening. And he doesn't need angels and he doesn't need you and me, but he uses us, right? And so he's sending out these men. It says, these are the ones that the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So their job is to patrol the earth. If you remember, a long time ago, we did the book of Job. You guys remember? In the book of Job chapter one, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan was with them. Now, you remember the question that the Lord asked? The sons of God, many Elohim, that's the angels. And as they've come before him, the angels are coming. It's like they're reporting on what they've been up to. So the angels are coming and the Lord's going to ask the question to them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you, from where have you come? And Satan says, I've been going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down it. So the idea in Job that we see is that Satan, the accuser of the brethren, he's going to play a role in these visions because he's going to be accusing the high priest in chapter four, a very important uh, um, vision that we're definitely going to make it to. So as we, as we, he's, so we, we have this view, angelic visitors, their role is to go around the whole earth and see what's going on, what's happening. And then they're reporting it to the Lord. And so he says, the, uh, and they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees. We have patrolled the earth. Behold, all the earth remains at rest. Now, why is he saying this? Got to keep in your mind what's happening culturally. What has occurred? The exile is over. The children of Israel have returned to the land. It's time to rebuild the Lord's house. It's time to rebuild what Israel, to see Israel once again grow into a nation. And so the report of the angels back to the angel of the Lord, ultimately back to God Almighty is, hey, the earth's at rest. So we should get cracking. There's no reason why we shouldn't be accomplishing the things that the last couple of prophets told us to do. We should probably be getting with it. Now look what he's going to say. Then it says in verse 12, the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have uh, no mercy on Jerusalem in the cities of Judah, which, uh, against which you have been angry these 70 years? How long is the captivity? 70 years. So the 70 years are up, right? Now, are the, do the angels know everything that's going on? I don't think they do because he's asking the question, right? Lord, what, what's going, what's going to happen? Well, the exile's over and God's going to see that Jerusalem's rebuilt along with the temple. So the angels may understand more than you and me, but they're not omniscient. 
They don't have the knowledge God does. So they ask God. If you remember in Peter, Peter's going to give some, uh, some examples to the church and he's going to tell them about certain behaviors they should stay away from. And he throws in this little quip because of the angels. Because the angels are watching. Because angels don't understand grace. You're the example of grace that is portrayed before them every day. So we have the curtains parted, an opportunity for Zechariah to see into the spiritual world what's going on, a report that's coming to God that the, the exile's over. Lord, is, are, is it, are they going to be able to come back and get this done? Is it over? Is the, is the wrath over? Is the judgment of God over? And so the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angels who, or to the angel who talked with me. So yeah, the Lord says, yeah, 70 years is up. It's over. The exile's done. The period, the 70 year period of judgment has been completed. So the angel who talked with me said, cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. Zion is like a reference to uh, the, the overall kingdom of Israel. Um, and oftentimes is used synonymously with Jerusalem or with the nation of Israel or with God dwelling in the nation of Israel at Zion. So he's saying, look, the Lord says, my heart is jealous. I want to be faithful to you. I want to see you succeed. I want to see you grow. I want to see you develop. I want to see these things happening. It's time to get to work. <clears throat> and then the Lord gives this hint. I am exceedingly angry with the nations. So the Lord is saying... And this is all this we always see when God uses other nations to judge Israel. They're going to come in and they're going to do the things that they do to the nation of Israel. And the Lord says, I'm going to allow this because you have abandoned me. So I'm abandoning you. And they're going to come in and this time period is going to take place. But the Lord holds those nations responsible for what they do to Israel. Just because God lets you do it don't mean what you're doing is right. Do we know that? Anybody understand the story of Balaam? We always ask the question, why did the Lord let him go? I don't know. You ever let your kids go out when you knew it wasn't going to be good? You ever go, okay, you know, you're going to have to make choices. I can't be with you 24-7. Have we learned that yet? When our kids are four, five, six, seven, 10, 11, 12, that's easy. 16, 17, 18, it's a little tougher, right? They have to make the choices that they're going to make. Just because you give them the freedom to make those choices doesn't mean you approve of their choices, does it? So we see the same thing happening here. Well, the Lord says to the nations, look, the things you did, the hatred you had toward the nation of Israel, I'm going to hold you accountable for. The slaughter that you made, just because I let you do it, doesn't mean it's okay. And so the Lord says, look, the, the nations, when they came against you, the things that they did, uh, basically it's like, look, the Lord drew a line, but every time the other nations came in judgment of Israel, they always crossed the line. They were always crueler than they needed to be. They're always harsher. The mob rules is never a good thing, right? You guys watched it the last few years, haven't you? When, when a riot starts, maybe they're peace. Maybe they, I don't think they were, but maybe they honestly just want to go out and make a statement about what's right and wrong. And then somebody throws a rock. And then what happens? We burn down a town or a city. We kill people. Those people you killed, was that Okay. So the Lord is saying, I'm going to hold you accountable for the choices you made. You made choices, although I allowed you to come and judge uh, the nation for their wickedness, you're still guilty for what you did. There's still guilt for what happened. And so the Lord is saying, I was angry with the nations for while I was angry a little, they furthered the disaster. You get the idea? They were overzealous to destroy Israel. And God is saying, that's not okay. That's not all right. So uh, he goes on and he says, and so <clears throat> therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house will be built again. What house is that? 
The Lord's house is what? It's the temple. So you're going to build the temple. My house shall be built uh, in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. That means God saying, you're mine. This is mine again. I'm stretching out. The, the measuring line is a way of saying, I own this. These are the boundaries. This is the land which I own stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts. My cities shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord again will comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. So the first vision is about, okay, guys, the exile's over. There's peace. The riders have gone out. They've gone to and fro. The Lord is saying, Jerusalem is mine. Israel's mine. It's going to be rebuilt. The temple's going to be rebuilt, and I'm with you. So that's vision number one. Everybody tracking? Okay, vision number one, laid out. Uh, he lays out the promise to the people. The exile's over. The Lord's mercies have returned. The temple will be rebuilt and the city will be rebuilt. Then we move on to vision number two. Vision number two is a vision of four horns and four craftsmen. So he starts. And I lift up my eyes and I saw, behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? See, do we have to guess? don't have to guess is he going to tell us <coughs> he's going to tell us he said to me these are the horns that have scattered judah israel and jerusalem so you remember the nations prior to the exile were divided everybody remember so israel divided into two parts they had a civil war they had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom that split the northern kingdom was conquered and taken by assyria the southern kingdom conquered and taken by babylon he is saying the four horns in the Bible, horns are a, uh, a metaphor or an example of strength, and they often will refer to uh, different kingdoms or power of those kingdoms. And so he's saying there were four horns, and what did these four horns do? They're the ones that scattered Israel. So we don't have to wonder who that was. We have to wonder who that was. Assyria did the north, Babylon did the south. If you want to go way back into the past, I suppose you could say Egypt did it, Assyria did it, and Babylon did it. But the point of it, the point of the story is these four horns are representative of those who have scattered Israel abroad. The nation ceased to exist, and the people found themselves in bondage yet again, right? Okay, so he goes on. Um, then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Israel or scattered Judah so that no one raised his head. And these have come to terrify them to cast down the horns of the nation who lifted their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So what's God saying? Similarly to how he ended vision number one, he's saying in vision number two, there's going to be a judgment that comes upon those nations. For example... Well, where's the Assyrian nation today? Oh, there's not one, is there? What about the Babylonian? Oh, they're not around either? Well, that's weird, isn't it? So what happened? You remember Daniel had a dream about the kingdoms of men and how the kingdoms of men are always in a state of flux. They're moving from gold to silver to, to right? We have the four kingdoms, Babylon, um, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece and Rome signified. But the point of the story is we're always moving. None of the human kingdoms are eternal, right? The end of Daniel's vision, there's a rock comes out of the heavens. Well, doesn't the New Testament call Jesus a stone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? Well, a rock comes out of the heavens, strikes the statue representing the kingdoms of men, and all the kingdoms of men turn into powder. And what happens? A mountain grows, it fills the whole earth, and it's the eternal kingdom of God. So the kingdom of men are passing away. The kingdom of God will come and be eternal, right? Okay, not, it's not hard to, to understand. So vision number two, the four horns represent the nations that scattered Israel. The four craftsmen that come behind are the tools that God's going to use 
to scare off or uh, get rid of those nations. And Daniel told us who they were. So Assyria was king and Babylon got rid of Assyria. And then Babylon was king and the Medo-Persians got rid of Babylon. Right? Did it stop there? No. You know, every one of these kingdoms had one thing in common. They all oppressed the nation of Israel. So under the, their, their oppression of the nation of Israel, then Greece comes and the Persians are gone. Then Rome comes and the Greeks are gone. You guys know it didn't stop there, right? There's still been kingdoms. They've still been oppressing. But a unique thing happened during the fourth kingdom. Why in Daniel's statues are there only four kingdoms? What happened under the fourth kingdom? Think about it. What happened under the fourth kingdom? Israel ceased to exist. So these four kingdoms lead to the destruction of Israel. Now they come back in 1948, but Daniel didn't need to know what happened in 1948, did he? Daniel needed to know four kingdoms are coming and the fourth kingdom, who, what else happened in the fourth kingdom? Not only was Israel destroyed, what else happened? Fourth kingdom, Jesus came, the Messiah came, right? The hope of Israel. So the hope of Israel came and the point is the kingdoms of God are going to overcome the kingdoms of man. So vision number two in Zechariah. Similarly, this is just showing God's ability. What did Daniel say? It's the Lord that raises up kings and brings down kingdoms, right? And so he's, he's going to do that in vision two. <clears throat> he's referring back to what he said already. In vision one, I was angry. They overstepped. I'm going to remove them. So no more Egypt power, no more Assyrian power, no more Babylonian power, no more Medo-Persian power. No more Greek power, no more Rome power. So those things have, find themselves removed. Now we find ourselves, <coughs> uh, don't bring me water, I have a monster. Oh, that's good. Okay, vision three, the plumb bob, the surveyor. <coughs> this one's a bit longer, chapter two, verse one. So I lifted up my eyes and I saw, behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I said, where are you going? And he said to measure Jerusalem to see its width and was it, what is its length. So you have a surveyor. He's going out. Do you remember what I told you? What's the point in the Bible of the measuring line? When God said to Ezekiel, go measure the temple. When God said to John in the book of Revelation, go measure the people in the temple. When God says to go measure things, he's declaring, that's mine. That's mine. The measuring line is a declaration of ownership, right? Well, you, you guys know how that works. If you go out to measure your property, nobody's going to complain, are they? If you show up with a survey team at your neighbor's house and start measuring his, is he going to say something? Like, what are you doing here? This is, you don't need to measure this. Why? It is mine. You go measure yours. So this, the man says to him, I'm here to measure Jerusalem to see what is its width and what is its length. And, be, and behold, the angel who talked with me came forward and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls. Now we know that the, the Jerusalem that was rebuilt uh, in Nehemiah's time, part of the whole story of Nehemiah, right, is they had a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other building the wall because they still found themselves under assault. But the Lord is saying as Jerusalem is rebuilt and as the history or the story of Israel continues to go through time, there will be a day when it doesn't need any walls. Now, you and I should be familiar with that because if you read in the book of Revelation and you read about the new Jerusalem, everybody familiar with the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven? It has walls, but you know how big they are? They're like a curb. In fact, the measure, when you hear the measurement of them, you go, why are you even talking about walls? That's small. That's not a wall. Anybody can get over that. What's the point? You don't need a wall. How come you don't need a wall? Because there's nobody trying to get over it. 
Look, there was a day that some of us gray hairs grew up and uh, didn't lock our doors. I still don't lock my door. Unless I'm not the last one to bed. If Kathy's the last one to bed, sometimes she locks it, which usually makes me mad because I'll walk outside thinking it's not locked. And then I'm stuck outside and I can't get back in the house. That ever happened to anybody? But there was a time when we didn't worry about that, right? When a, still today, I should, probably should not announce all these things. You come to my house uh, and go over to my truck parked in the, in the, at the side of my house and the key's in my truck. Well, it's not because I want you to steal it. I just want to know where my key is. And that's the easiest way for me to take care of it. Now, that may, not be, that may not be wise today, but the Bible talks about a day when you're not going to need walls. Now, this is not that day. But the point is, this message of hope to the people who are hearing it is, hey, we got to build walls today, but there's a day coming. We're not going to need any walls. We've got to maybe... Uh, have and have we have the right to bear arms to protect ourselves from a tyrannical government but there will be a day you won't need it right when jesus is king you think you're going to need a gun okay it's not going to do any good anyway right and the point the point is now those things are a part of life but there's a day coming that we won't have to worry about it. So listen to what he says. The angel tells the other angel, you go catch the guy who's doing the measuring and you let him know Jerusalem will be like villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. There's going to be so many people here that you're not, you can't fit them in the walls. People are going to be everywhere. There'll be livestock. He says, and I will be to her a wall of fire around her, declares the Lord. So if the Lord's your protection, what protection do you need? So the Lord says, look, I'll be a wall of fire all around her, declares the Lord. I will be the glory in her midst. Now, I want you to listen. He's speaking future tense. I will be. He's not saying I am right now. Because right now, most of it is a rubble, right? There's a lot of rebuilding that needs to take place. So if you look over the history, after Nehemiah, Jerusalem it struggles. It, it's going to be oppressed by Rome. And then one day Jesus is going to come and walk in the middle of it, right? And the glory of God is going to be in the midst of Jerusalem again. And then we also have a future hope for a new Jerusalem, right? So we see this. This, uh, this prophecy as the, as the Lord is giving Zechariah a vision of what is to come, that you're not going to need a wall, I'll be her wall. Verse 6, he says, up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Now, he's always going to use this term. And a lot of people, especially today, want to use this term and say, well, if you're having to run away from the enemy to your north, if you draw a line straight up from Jerusalem, you hit Russia, Russia's the bad guy. I just want you to know that idea began during the Cold War. Before the Cold War, it was Napoleon. Before Napoleon, it was somebody else. Because the earth has always existed with a bad guy, right? Somewhere, somehow, there's a bad guy. So... When the Lord says, because he's referring to Babylon, we're going to see in a moment. When the Lord says, flee from your enemy from the north, he's saying, whenever God brings judgment upon Israel, he tells them, I'm going to bring it from the north. It's a signal or a symbol that God is allowing the judgment. Babylon judged Israel and Jerusalem. Babylon was the enemy from the north, but on a map, She's on the east. So it's laying out, flee from the land of the north, around declares the Lord, I will be, or I'm sorry, let's try that again. Flee from the land of the north declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens declares the Lord. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell in the daughter of Babylon. Oh, who was he talking about the enemy to the north? I just told you who are they fleeing from. The daughter of Babylon. 
Now, why is God telling them to flee? Remember in the first vision, he said, I'm a little upset about how much they, they took out on you guys. Then he said, I'm going to judge them again. And now he's telling those people who stayed in Babylon, don't stay there. Get out of the, the enemy to the north. Leave there. Go back to Israel. Go back home. You guys know, I've shared with you, 42,000 returned, but that's not the total number of people who were in Babylon. Because some people had businesses and lives and they liked what they had and they wanted to stay in Babylon. And God's saying, no, don't stay in Babylon. Get out of Babylon. Flee the enemy to the north. Go home, uh, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. So the Lord is saying, look, I'm going to judge the area around Babylon. The Medo-Persians are going to become the Greeks. The Greeks are going to become the Romans, right? That's historic. That's what occurred. So God is saying, go back home. Go back home. I have opened the way. It's time to go home. And so behold, he says, I will shake my hand over them and they will become plundered to those who serve them. So one after another, after another, do a historical look at the kingdoms of earth. The ones who are, are oppressed, somehow they fight, they wiggle, they squirm, they build armies, they rebel against and they become those in power. And then what happens? They oppress somebody else. That's the story. You guys remember the old book by George Orwell, The Animal Farm? And eventually the animals discovered it was the animals running the farm. That's the whole point of that is talking about that cycle of humanity. Is man wicked? Is his heart wicked? Yes. Yeah. Did the Lord tell us that? What's the cure to the wickedness of man's heart? Jesus, Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus is the cure. And so... He's letting them know, look, I'm going to deal with them. I will deal with the nations. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Now, the Lord's talking about that time in which he will be in the midst of his people. And listen to how he describes it. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day. Is, was there a time historically, when the nations of the earth began to join themselves to the Lord. For sure. For sure. What's happening when the gospel's going forward? What's, what's going on? Israel's being saved. And while Israel's being saved, were the nations being called to? And are the nations being gathered together as well? And they will join themselves to the Lord in that day, and they shall be my people. If you're confused by that, uh, Galatians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 2, read those. They describe the exact same thing. And so you see them gathering together, the nations coming together, and uh, uh, the wall, how does, it, how does uh, Ephesians put it? The wall of, uh, it's not the wall of separation, but you'll, you'll read it and see. But basically, the wall of separation is going to be torn down. And the oracles the, that are against you are going to be taken out of the way, being nailed where? To the cross. To the cross. And then salvation today. Is there a nation under heaven that cannot be saved by the blood of Christ? No. Nope. So you can get them all. Everyone can be reached today. So now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Today is the day, right? And so... I think, I think this is what he's seeing. I think this is what he's laying out. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord that day, and they shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you will know that the Lord of, the, of, the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. And what's going to happen on that day? What's the Bible say? How many knees will bow? How many tongues will confess? 
Jesus Christ is Lord. I think it'll be quiet after that happens. Be silent, all flesh before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. So vision three is the vision of the surveyor. All of Jerusalem is mine. It gives us kind of a, a vision or a scope of the history of what's going to come and what is in the future for the nation of Israel. So we started, uh, if you remember, we started with the writers riding around saying, it's peace, it's time to go to work. Let's go to work. God's going to judge the nations who hurt you. Ch uh, the second vision, the judgment on the nations who hurt him. The third vision, all of Jerusalem is mine and she has a future. Does she have a future? Yes, she does. Jerusalem has a future, and so the Lord lays all of that out. Now, chapter 3, we'll, we'll try to go quick. We'll spend a little more time on it the next time because chapter 4 is like a mirror, or sorry, yeah, chapter 4, but the fifth vision is like a mirror of this. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. We've seen this kind of explanation before, haven't we? And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? So he's looking at Joshua the high priest. Joshua the high priest, perfect. Is Joshua the high priest righteous because of his deeds of upholding the law? No. Why is he perfect? Because God imputes his righteousness to him. And the Lord declares, I chose him. And I'm taking him out of the fire. He's mine. He's mine. It's a beautiful picture. Now, Joshua, Joshua was standing before the angel and he's clothed in filthy garments. He's a filthy high priest from a filthy nation in a filthy place. The land's not built. The temple's not built. Everything is a mess. But God is saying, I have redeemed you. When we were redeemed, were we perfect, just pretty, all dressed up in a nice little dress? We had our whole, everything all together? No? That comes after, right? And that's what the story tells us. He's clothed with filthy garments, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. Isn't that the same thing he did to Isaiah? He touched Isaiah's lips and said, your sins are purged from you. He, he does the same thing when he calls Ezekiel. He does the same thing when he calls his prophets. What about Abraham when it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness? The Lord takes his sin and gives him rights. What about a, a, a person who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ today? What happens? He takes away your sin. As far as the east is... That's how far he's removed it from you, right? This is the same thing that we're seeing. There was not a different plan of salvation in the Old Testament. You can only be saved by faith. You cannot be saved by works, right? So when we look at this, this is an example. God is, is describing this example before Joshua, who is the high priest of the people who return. Two guys return, Joshua and Zerubbabel. We'll see Zerubbabel next chapter. Joshua and Zerubbabel, Joshua's high priest, Zerubbabel would be the king, but because they're underneath the Medo-Persian, he'll just be a governor. So he says, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. I'm, I'm dressing you up in the high priestly garb. I'm hooking you up. And I said... Let them put a clean turban on his head. Now, the turban of the high priest, you remember what it says? Holy to the Lord. That's right. Holy to the Lord. Like I'm totally committed and submitted to, to the Lord. That was what the, the, the turban represented. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. This is what you call an if-then covenant, right? If you do this, then I will do that. I want you to know this covenant is going to be fulfilled by the branch. Who's the branch? 
Jesus. He's going to talk about him here in just a minute. He says, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you will rule in my house, have charge over my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. You are acting out. This is a symbol and a sign of what? Behold, I will bring my servant, the Nazet. Nazer, N-A-Z-E-R, the branch. Nazer, there was a place Jesus grew up. You remember what it was called? Oh, why did they call him? Why was, what did Nazareth mean? What was that? Oh, the branches. Interesting, no? Here, Jesus, the branch. Here he comes. I will bring my servant, the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua... On a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave this, this, this inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. How do you do that? You know how he did it. That's right. He did it at the cross, right? At the cross, he's talking about Messiah. Remember I told you the tip of the point in all of the visions is coming to Jesus. Why do they need to build the temple? Because Jesus is going to come to that temple, right? He's going to cleanse that temple. He's going to declare that temple desolate. He's going to die outside the city. He's going to remove the sin of the nation in a single day. All these things that Zechariah is talking about, Jesus will accomplish in that day declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. There will be unity. Where will the unity be? In Christ. Why? Because that's where our sins are forgiven. It's not about any of the other things that we use to divide ourselves now. It's all about Jesus, right? Right? It's all going to be about him. So this is the first four visions pointing toward Christ. The next four are going to start with Christ and go back uh, in a similar fashion. So we'll look at those the next time we get together. Amen? You made it. Hope it wasn't too painful. Why don't you guys stand with me and let's pray. Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, possibly the last of the prophets that Jesus describes in Matthew 23, <clears throat> who died in the temple for the word of the Lord. God, as we look at these prophecies and we see your plan for the nation of Israel, and we see hints, little hints, little shadows of what's coming for the nations. Lord, we're reminded of the incredible reality that Joshua, the high priest, could not uphold the if-then covenant. If you walk all the days of your life with me, then I will let you rule and reign. But God knows we're not going to do it. We're going to stumble and we're going to fall. So what did he do? He sent his son who did it who walked the path that the Lord laid out, who was obedient to his law, who fulfilled the law perfectly, who only did the things that the Father told him to do. He always spoke the word and was obedient to God. And then he died on the cross so that we could have in one day our sins purged. What a glorious promise as we come to Zechariah to see God you uh, this was not plan B, plan C, plan D. I don't know what I'm going to do. No, Lord, this was the way that you were going to save the nations. This is the way that you're going to save me and you. This is how you will save everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. What a glorious hope your word delivers to us. So, God, I just pray that we would... Uh, be challenged, Lord, to grow and to know you, Lord, to understand the truth of your word and to allow you to speak to and through us 
in these days because it's still true today. No matter where you come from or what you've done, the blood of Jesus Christ can wash you clean. So, Lord, we, uh, we just pray your blessing as we go from this place. Lord, uh, keep our, our eyes and our hearts set on you. And, Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would be glorified in and through it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going <clears> to <throat> close out tonight with, uh, like always, with a uh, uh, song of worship. Hopefully I can pick up that pick. <clears throat> but also we're going to have um, the, the deacons and the elders who are with us tonight. They'll be around the room. So we want to give you opportunity anytime we gather. If you need prayer, uh, they're here with you to pray. And uh, um, please take the time to, to go pray with them. That's, uh, that's what they're here to do. So God bless you all. go from this place, Lord, be glorified in the lives we live out before you as we seek to honor you in the things we say and do. We give you all the